this is why I love a show like this because we want to celebrate these heroes, especially when we get an announcement like we did last night from Sting. But uh, Bully, I remember, and you know me, and Tommy, you know me. What did I do last night? I did my laminated list of greatest uh, uh, Sting matches of all time. And one of those matches was the match you had, Bully, with Sting at Slammiversary in Boston. And I and I look back at that night, and um, one of the things I remember is Sting before Slammiversary doing a meet and greet with the fans. And I just remember that line of fans to meet Sting. And I just remember that line like wrapping around the block. Um, Sting's an icon. And we, you know, we could talk about Sting and his greatest matches and where you put him on the Mount Rushmore or the greatest of all time. But Bully, and you were in the ring with him. You know, Sting had that something special. Like, I know people use the word legend a lot and the word icon a lot, but I think it's fair to to attach those terms to somebody like Sting. One of the highlights of my career was getting to work with Sting and with Hulk Hogan in TNA. Never in my life did I think I'd be a singles wrestler uh, or a singles wrestler who somebody saw a lot uh, a lot in as Eric Bischoff saw in me and allowed me and handed me the ball and allowed me to have the run that I did in TNA. The thing that I appreciated and liked the most about Sting was our interaction together. We, uh, we always joked around uh, about the word reverence because uh, reverence is respect. And I've always had a ton of respect in the business. Whenever me and Sting would talk, you know, I always showed him a, a tremendous amount of respect. And then it time to be, be time to get in the ring. And I kind of took that re reverence and respect and I threw it out the window. Uh, not that I didn't respect him in the ring, but I needed to have the best of Sting at all times. And sometimes that meant taking Sting and popping him in the mouth or upside the head, or laying something in. Because I found that the more aggressive I was with Sting in the ring, the more aggressive he was back. And it brought something out of him. There was a time when Sting was doubtful of himself out there. Felt like maybe he didn't have it anymore. Or, or thought to himself, maybe I can't perform at a certain level. But if you would just help bring it out of him, he performed at the top of his game. And uh, the the tag matches that I had with him, the singles matches that I had with him, obviously the one that culminated at Slammiversary in Boston that you liked very much, and a lot of fans liked uh, very much. Good match with a very innovative, uh, you know, finish to the match it had never been done before in which we cut back the ring uh apron and we exposed the boards nobody had done that and if it had ever been done before it, it probably was 30 years ago yeah I, it was it was almost a shock to me when i saw it that night so you know we pulled out all the stops i i enjoyed my time personally with sting I enjoyed my time professionally with Sting, and I consider myself very lucky and a smarter performer for the amount of time I got to spend with him and learn from him and just, you know, be friends with him in the wrestling business. It's kind of funny. If you if if uh if somebody were to tell a 15-year-old bully ray that, oh yeah, at some point you're gonna be in a story with Hulk Hogan, and then in a feud with Sting, you probably wouldn't believe them. No, because I would have told you I don't care about that because I I want to be in a story in a program with the Road Warriors. I want to be in a That's story true. in a program with the Steiners. That's how yeah, yeah. diehard of a tag team guy I was. You want to be uh, teaming with Tony Gurria. Uh Tommy, any, uh, any uh, stories when it comes to Sting for you? Uh, sure. I never met um sting until i went to tna and like i said i was a massive sting 
fan. Uh, then when I got to work with him, I mean, I agented his matches, which was kind of surreal. I also was able to get in the ring with him. Uh, I was in a battle royal, and he was the first person I was targeting because I said, no matter what, I'm getting to Sting to have to have a moment with Sting. And I started doing Sting's comeback on Sting until <laughs> I told Sting to do his comeback back to me. Um, but no, nah, he was awesome. He was awesome to deal with in TNA. Uh, always loved work with him. I saw him a couple times when I went to AEW. Uh, he's a great dude. He really is. And I've seen him a bunch of times on, you know, conventions and uh, stuff. And, you know, when he's able to still go out there, like you said, that line, that line, he's introduced himself. You talk about he's wrestled in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2000s, uh, 20s. There's so many different generations that know Sting. When he wants to go out of the house, he could do any signing that he wants to do to get out of the house, go on a vacation, and still get that little bit of a taste of the pro wrestling life. As well as, I mean, if I have Sting, if I'm a Tony Khan, I use him as a, as a brand ambassador. I thought that was great what WWE did with certain legends, and I think uh, AEW could do that with certain people as well. Well, Dave, what, what did, I'm just going to tell you, I, you know how I am about these stories. You used to actually tell me to tell them more often. So I'll, I, I think I might have told this one once. I had a mark out moment, complete fanboy mark out moment with Sting. And we we were right in the middle of the whole Aces and Eight story where me and Sting were tagging together and we had to get the blessing of Hulk and all this. And we're in performing, I believe, in Manchester. 10,000 people, because Impact was massively over in England. Yes. Place is just about sold out. Me and Sting tagging against the other guy, against uh, uh, Doc and Knox in, in, uh, in the Aces and Eights. And I walked into Sting's locker room, and he's doing his makeup. And I said, hey, will you paint me up also? And he he paused, and he looked at me, and he was like, Absolutely, I will. Like, I, I think he was taken back by the fact that I wanted to be painted up like him. So there I am. I'm, I'm sitting there like a little kid, you know, <laughs> while Sting's painting my face. Do you remember the scene in the movie Django where Jamie Foxx is listening to the, the, the German man tell the story? about uh broom hilda jamie fox is sitting there like a little kid and he's you know, he's bobbing up and down and he's asking questions and you can see this smile on his face that's the way i was like I, and and one of the reasons that i love sting was as a kid he was so colorful and he always changed his makeup. He always had on a different look. And he's involved in one of my favorite matches of all time on my favorite pay-per-view of all time. You know, Halloween Havoc 89. He was in the Thunderdome with Flair and Muda and Funk and Bruno is the special guest ref. So all of that just comes together and it's just me and him in a room. And there he is painted up my face and I'm posting this picture right now on social media awesome. for everybody to see. That's all. See, that's it. I mean, this is like, these are those types of moments. And Tommy, I know you appreciate these are these types of shows where I love hearing stories from you guys and then hearing stories from the fans. But my favorite story about Sting doesn't involve Sting, the wrestler at all. Uh, my, my story involves Sting, the singer of the police, <laughs> because... Sting was at Sirius XM and we were doing busted open. And I was like, shit, let me see. I go out and I actually went up to Sting, the singer. And I said, sir, appreciate you. <laughs> you're, you're a whole favor, but you know, I host a pro wrestling show, you know, would you want to have some fun and come on the air and, I'll ask you questions like you're Sting the Wrestler. Would you be into that? Would you do that? And he gave me this look, and he looked at me for about three seconds without speaking a word, and I actually was like, oh, my God, 
I just lost my job. Like now, like, you know, cause there's all, you know, they all have the posse around, like all the PR people around them and everything. And for like legit three seconds, there's silence. And then he was like, sure. And then the PR people just jumped in and they were like, no, he's busy. He's got other interviews to do. And they, they brushed him off. But I heard as he was walking away, he turned to one of the PR people. He goes, you know, I would have done it. I would have done it. I was like, oh, that would have been so great. But like legit, the rest of that day, I thought for sure somebody was going to come in and fire me for asking Sting to pretend like, you know, like that I was asking him questions as Sting the wrestler. But how great would that have been? Because I would have had him come in studio and I would have asked him questions about, you know, what was it like wrestling Ric Flair at Clash of Champions in 1988? Like that would have been, I thought, good radio, but... Serious XM officials thought otherwise. The zombies got you. Yeah, uh, the zombies got. He was willing to do it though. Think about it. like that takes con- that takes a little bit of set of balls on my part to go up to fucking Sting, the rock and roll star, and ask him to you know to be a part of. Is it really? Is it training. really big balls or just lack of brains? Yeah, lack of brains. <laughs> Probably lack of brains. <laughs> <laughs> All right, part of being Dave Lagreca, being dumb. <laughs> DDP, one of the other things we wanted to talk to you about, because I don't know if you've even heard this, because it just happened last night, but Sting has been working with AEW. Last night on Dynamite, he made the announcement that at Revolution in March, uh, just five months away, he's going to have the final match of his career. He's going to be 65 years old. First, did you hear the news? Oh, no, I, I heard that he was thinking about it. I wasn't sure exactly when he was going to do it, but man, that, that there's certain guys in this business that I really hold dear to my heart. And that's one of them. And when I saw him out there, (laughs) when he jumped off the wall, whatever the hell that was, it went through two tables. I'm like, Oh my God. You know, I, I can remember texting him one time after, some huge bump he took and go, are you okay? <laughs> but you know what? He's been resilient. And Sting has the kiss of like, I call it the um, the uh, wrestling number one or wrestling number two. I can't remember what numbers he was. You know, with a mask uh, or kiss with the makeup. They could go like uh, Gene Simmons, at, I don't know, I think he's 78, is about to do his last tour. You know, but he ain't taking no bumps. So, you know, I I think Sting has had one of the most glorious careers that you could ever have. And I told him, I said, Sting, at some point, I'm gonna get you. You're gonna come, <laughs> you're gonna come looking for me. And I just want you to know, brother, I am always here when <laughs> when you're ready. But really shocking to me that he didn't just phone anything in. Yeah, and he and he could have. You know, and still being, you know, all he would have to do is come, but if it would have been dust, all he would have to do is lay a couple elbows. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, that's that's all he would have needed to do a splash, boom, boom, scorpion. They done went crazy, but he didn't do that. So God bless him, man. I, you know, I love the cat. Paige, you said Sting is a guy that you hold uh, near and dear to your heart. Is that on a personal level, a professional level, or both? In every way, shape, or form. I used to have my, I think, of course, my my my, my fondest memories, of course, in professional wrestling will be, you know, my first win over Randy Savage, you know, the, the world championship when Sting was in there and Hogan and Nature, Nature Boy took the cutter in the middle for the world title. But my favorite match is on Nitro. I'm the world champ. We're in main event. I believe, I heard at the time, I'm, I'm not absolutely positive, but I think it was the last quarter hour that WCW ever won against the WWE. And we were in the match. And it's going great. And then Charles Robinson, I believe, says, D. I could be, we're going home. This is it. We're going home. And he goes, you got five more minutes. I'm like, what? 
and his sting came at me. I grabbed him, and I'm going to throw him to the floor. I go, we got five more minutes, and he didn't hear me. He just saw me grabbing him. Like, we didn't talk about any of this, and we're going home. I throw him to the floor, and he's hot. He gets up. And I gotta like like shoot, grab him by the throat, and go, bro. We got five more minutes, and I get to the shop, and called it all on the fly because we had worked so you know so many times together. We knew each other's you know. Every time I would ever pick him up for the fucking spinning power bomb, seated power bomb, I would do when I go up, he'd rub my hair and go shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> and then we spin down into it. But it if I look at you know at the end that the finish was I fucking I get him for the diamond cutter, but I pull him back and I go to take off and I have to hold the ropes. And then I come back and I pull down and he holds the ropes and then hits me with the uh with the uh the death drop. Scorpion death drop. Yeah, and uh that that was the biggest pop I've ever heard. Because again, I got it for the cutter. Oh no, you know. <laughs> and and I've got, that was the night I won the world title on the uh, on the you know lost it and won it in the same night in a four way dance later. But uh, Sting was always, I mean, always there for me as a buddy. And as I earned my way up, and you know this kind of bubble, when when one guy goes from the you know the bottom or the middle of the card to the very tippity top, there is a lot of heat that comes with that, you know, yeah. because everybody wants to see everybody do great until all of a sudden that well, why him? Why is that happening? And you get a lot of heat from that and sting never you go you're 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 real friends and at that time you got it's really hard because you, you have you have that group that you hang with but that group that you hang with kind of they're kind of pissed that didn't happen for them too you know or you went above them or whatever the reason was sting and a lot of it had to do with too around that time i got to do the malone thing right that was the Hogan said to me four years earlier, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because it's not tomorrow or next year or the year after, but somewhere down the line, I believe you have the ability to draw huge money with me. And we were in Berlin at the time. And when he walked away, I was just like, oh, my God, did Hulk Hogan just say he watched my matches? But when I that whole Malone, Rodman thing, that was all my idea. Mainly because I heard Rodman was coming in for the second time, and Carl and I had gotten so close that I knew he loved wrestling. So I literally, and Carl's got, I have a documentary on for uh, on A and E coming up at some point. Carl's in there talking about this, so I literally called him up, got him to say, "Yeah, I'm interested." Went over to see Bish. Bish really didn't know Carl Malone. He wasn't a basketball fan. Of course, everybody knew Rodman. But that was the night that they beat uh, the Utah Jazz, swept the L.A. Lakers with Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant. And Carl at like 34 points or whatever, he just manhandled Shaq, which Shaq must have been sick or something because Shaq, nobody manhandled Shaq. But when Bish saw it, he's like, call him up, make the deal. Now, that was all my idea. Oh, the whole thing is Bish set it up, but showing up on the friggin' Tonight Show. My idea. I ran it by Bish. He made it happen. A lot of heat came with that. But the real heat came. Now it's going to be me and Leno against Hogan and Bischoff. And I don't care, you know, what the situ situation is. That's a mainstream audience thing. Not, you know, the wrestling fans, sure, they hated it. I didn't give, I didn't care. It was, I cared about 
cow, how good can we make this? And the only reason Bischoff put me in that position, because he knew there was a handful of guys who could really lay out a match from beginning to end, because it just wasn't done like that. Spots, yes, you know, but Randy Savage and me, I wanted to lay it all out, and then I wanted to improv throughout it, where, man, oh, the abuse that I would take for that, now everyone does it, you know, with improv mixed in. But back then, when you're a trailblazer and no one said nothing to Randy because he was Randy Savage, but I heard a thing with Steamboat talking about that match and like Randy had it all that we do this, we do that, we do this. That's why it was so great. But when you can do that too and improv the stuff, that's a great part. That whole ending match for me and Sting. It's five more minutes. The best shit I've ever done because we had the people so like right there, you know? Good stuff, so, bro. Good stuff. Good you know? stuff, man. Lyra Valkyria joins us right here on Busted Open. Lyra, welcome to Busted Open and thanks for the time. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Lyra, did he get the pronunciation of your last name correct? Damn right I did. Good. Damn okay. right. I know what I watch. I watch NXT every single Tuesday night. And Lyra, like, there's a lot to talk about. This is the first of all, this is the first time here on Busted Open. So thank you for the time and thanks for joining us. No, thank you. No problem. Uh, let me ask you another question. How many interviews have you done, Lyra? Uh, this is my first with WWE. Wow, wow. excellent. <laughs> All right. you're, I love it. Your first time, and you get to be on the air with me. Trump. Can't believe it. <laughs> right to the deep end yeah. with the great one. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, kidding. Here we go. I'm kidding. Right with the Hall of Famer. Right with the Hall of Famer. <laughs> but, uh, Lyra, listen, you know, the success of NXT and how many people now are watching NXT every Tuesday night. You're a part of that experience. You're a part of that team. You're one of the reasons why. How excited are you to be a part of that NXT roster? I genuinely can't put it into words because my opponent at Halloween Havoc, Becky, I can't imagine a more significant opponent or a more significant stage because my early days in this world, everything was was all about NXT. It was the thing I couldn't miss each week. It was the thing motivating me to want to be here. NXT was always the stage that I wanted to get to. And Halloween Havoc, wrestling Becky Lynch for the NXT Women's Championship, that's just not something that I even thought would be in the realms of possibility because Becky, she's one of the most decorated women in, in all of WWE. And I just... I couldn't have imagined that 2023 she would be the NXT Women's Champion and and this would be my stage to show what I've got and just I can't believe it I can't put it into words. <laughs> so Lyra would it be safe to say that like Becky Lynch is an, a huge inspiration to you maybe one of your heroes in pro wrestling? She's a huge inspiration to me. Um she's she's from very close to where I grew up. We tra we trained on the same mats by the same people everything um and i I've, I've told the world that now but it, it's going to be very different at halloween havoc because we're opponents now and and that has to go out the window i i can't think that way anymore um because it's it's not about how much of an inspiration she was to me anymore she's got something that i want now and i wasn't working all these years to be worthy to stand across the ring from her i've been working all these years to become someone who can beat Becky Lynch. You, you gave the right answer. You're going to have to separate it come Halloween Havoc. But let's let's be honest. When the bell rings and you have to out-wrestle and out-fight and out-perform Becky Lynch, do you think you have it in you to get rid of the fandom and get down to business? I think I do. I think when that bell, bell rings, I'm well able to turn that switch off and just see an opponent across from me. And just because I, I could never have imagined this happening so quickly 
in my career within my first year in NXT. But I've been showing that I'm so capable of this because I've, I've gone toe to toe with Rhea Ripley, the women's world champion. I've had an NXT women's championship opportunity just before and I feel more ready now than ever. And I feel like I'm championship material now and now is the time. Well, Lyra, I think you made a definitive statement at the end of NXT on Tuesday night when you took that picture of you and Becky together and ripped it in half. And you said, in one week, that title is mine. I mean, I think at that moment, that was really when you separated you as a fan of Becky Lynch and you as a challenger to that NXT Women's Championship. That That's exactly it. That was exactly what I intended to do when I tore that picture in half. It's Lyra, how long have you been at it now, uh, career between your training and your time in NXT or anything that you might have done in between? This is my ninth year. Um, I, I started the same week. It was the day of Money in the Bank 2014 was the day I had my first training session, four days after Becky's debut that I saw on NXT. Wow. And, and I know, like, we talk about this match. And, like, and again, I think... Listen, I can hear it in your voice. You're excited. I can hear in your voice that this is obviously the biggest moment and the biggest match of your career. But I feel like a lot of people feel this way as well, that you deserve and have earned uh, this opportunity coming up next week. I would feel that with everything that you've gone through. And I know in a lot of ways, one year is not a lot of time. But in this one year for the NXT brand, there's been a lot of growth with this brand. Do you feel like, hey, you know, what? I've earned this position in this match next week at Halloween Havoc? Oh, I absolutely feel like I've earned this position. I've been doing this for a long time, but at the same time, I still feel like I'm at the beginning of my career and that I still have so much to show and to do. Um, but yeah, it's a very competitive time in NXT. We've got so many women coming through. We've got the the women's breakout tournament unfolding every Tuesday as well. So my eyes are on that. My eyes are on Becky. There's so much going on right now. Lyra, what would you say is your number one strength in the ring? And if you're comfortable enough saying it, what would you say is your number one weakness? I think my my strength is my athletic ability in the ring and my technical side. Uh, that's my wheelhouse. That's where I feel most most comfortable. But I think I've... I think my weakness is going to be tested in this ring because I will have to turn off that switch and, and just not think about who I'm in the ring with and, and and all that kind of thing. Like, I really need to just be ready and be present and be there. So when your hero, Becky Lynch, punches you in the face, you're ready to punch her in the face back, right? Yeah, if I get punched in the face, it doesn't matter if it's my hero or if it's not. Like, all you're thinking about is punching back. All you're thinking about is that NXT uh, championship. Yeah, I'm thinking about that gold, and I want that. Uh, Lyra, you just told us earlier that this is your first ever interview as part of the WWE. By the way, thank you that you made uh, the, your first interview be with us. I We appreciate that very much. Uh, no, but thank now, you. But now, like... Now that this is this is open now, now that you've broken the seal and you've done your first interview, are you ready now to be a part of those media scrums? Are you ready to be doing a bunch of interviews? Because now you're going to be out there, especially next week if you win this NXT Women's Championship. Oh, absolutely. It's a huge part of, of what I want to do and what I want to be a part of here in WWE, so I'm more than ready. Did you always want to be a professional wrestler? Um, from discovering WWE, it it was NXT and seeing Becky debut that made me want to do this. Um, wow. You don't, you don't hear that a lot, right, Dave, that it was the actual NXT product that inspired somebody to be a wrestler. But it makes sense because Lyra is young and NXT has been around now for a while for, for you and me, Bully, it's something new, but it's been around and it's built like where we're seeing now women and men who have main evented WrestleMania that have come from the NXT brand. So it makes sense. So, yeah, that's excellent. All right. So Lyra, when it comes to next week, let's say you win 
that NXT Women's Championship. As a matter of fact, let's just say you're going to win. When you win that NXT Women's Championship next week, what's the first thing you're going to do with that NXT Championship title? I'm going to call up everyone at home and say that I did it. <laughs> and 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 I don't know I don't know if they they told you this or if, if you know this or not, but you have to sleep next to the championship. Oh, you lay, you yeah, lay the championship that, yeah. in bed and you actually sleep next to it. I'll do that, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. You know, Lyra, what are some, being this is your first interview with the WWE, get, tell me, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what do you like doing outside of the ring? Outside of the ring, uh, I'm very into like fantasy, uh, reading, novels, all that kind of thing. Fitness. You mean like with elves and stuff? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> like Lord of the Rings type stuff? Obsessed with Lord of the Rings. Obsessed. Oh, we have something in common. I like Lord of the Rings too. Really? Yes. I have a I'm believe it or not, I have a lot of geek in me. <laughs> yeah, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, anything Tolkien, I love, I love all of that. By any chance, are you a Star Wars fan? I'm a Star Wars fan. Big fan of the prequels. There, no, no, you don't hear that a lot, but prequels yeah. are my favorite. <laughs> I love the prequels too. Mm -hmm. God, you and Pully are hitting it off. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, Lyra, not big it's, on. Star it's going Wars. a lot better than with than with Triff, Tiffany Stratton. She didn't know who I was, so you know. Yeah, that's right, Tiffany <laughs> Stratton. <laughs> Listen, but the 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 Lord too much walking. With the Lord of the Rings. They're walking here, walking there, searching for the ring. Well, too much walking for me. But I guess that goes hand in hand with you being into fitness. That's the only thing I can think of. Very wordy, that J.R.R. <laughs> Tolkien guy. He is, yeah. I, I love him so much. <laughs> uh, Jade Cargill. Obviously, everybody's been talking about Jade Cargill. Jade Cargill made her presence known almost immediately after you ripped up that picture just as a competitor, the competitor in you, are you hoping that Jay Cargill lands with NXT? Yes, absolutely. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, hype and people wondering where she's going to go, but if I win that championship, she'd be someone that I'd have my eye on and I would absolutely love to go up against. Lyra, one of the questions that I ask any of the NXT talent that comes on with us is you got such great coaches down at NXT, uh, a, a lot of knowledge uh, down there and a lot of, you know, men and women that you can learn from. Who do you turn to, to, to learn the most from? Or if you have a very specific question, do you have a go-to coach down in NXT? Uh, Johnny Moss is a fantastic coach. He's actually someone that before I ever was anywhere near WWE, um, I remember being in, in college and uh, trying to put off my college exams to the summer so I could go over uh, to the UK and train with Johnny Moss. And then it was just one of those things where all those years later, he ended up as my coach in the performance center as well. So Johnny Moss. All right. Well, Lyra, I just texted Bilbo Baggins, and he thinks that you're going to win this match next week against against Becky Lynch. So we may see a new uh, NXT Women's Champion. Seriously, Lyra, thank you so much for the time. We're looking forward to Halloween Havoc next Tuesday. Again, 8 p.m. Eastern time on the USA Cable Network. Two weeks of Halloween Havoc, and I guess Lyra... Valkyria, thank you so much for the time. Good luck, and thank you, seriously, for making us your first ever interview with the WWE. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you. And you know what? And Lyra, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm making a promise to you right now. Before your match next week, I promise to read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings before before your match next week. No, for you. For you. Because you've inspired me now to open up my mind, open up my eyes. And I'm gonna I'm gonna hit J, some J.R.R. Tolkien really hard over the next week before your match. That's that's a big promise. Have you seen how big those books are? <laughs> Lyra, he's so maybe, lying. Yes, so he's maybe lying. I'll re, so maybe I'll do the book and record. Maybe I'll do the book and record. Seriously, Lyra, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good luck, and may the force be with you. <laughs> Bye, guys.